Hey, good morning, everyone. This is Pastor Kevin, Lighthouse Assembly. Well, I'm hoping that if, if you're part of our church, I'm hoping you, uh, you join along with this in worship and in call to worship and just preparing your hearts. And I, my hope and prayer also is that you, you approach today like you would any day going to church, that you got up with your family, you ate breakfast. Uh, you know, if you're sitting around in pajamas, that, that's okay. Um, but I, I just encourage you to turn off other devices except for the one you're watching this on. Uh, limit the distractions, and let's, let's engage as if we were at church, because I, I believe God wants to speak to us. If you're new with us, if you've never uh, been a part of Lighthouse Assembly and you're viewing today, thank you so much for taking the time to worship with us. Uh, we're excited to have you. For those of you that are uh, a part of our church family, regular members, thank you too. Yeah, I'm praying for all of you. I know this time uh, we've got uh, just a lot of things going on and a lot of things going through our minds, but... Uh, you know, I really believe that, that God's going to do something through this, that, that we're going to come out of this better than we were before. And that's really my hope and my prayer, um, not only for the church, but for you. You know, so let's take advantage of this time to be with our families, to be with our loved ones, to, you know, to just to enjoy the, the time off. Let's not, get, um, let's not get, get wrapped up in the fear and the panic that others are, but instead let's, let's really look to God and turn to God for, for our hope and our refuge and our peace during this time. I just want to open this morning with, with a word of prayer before we get into the word. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for the opportunity to, Lord, to be with you, to hear from your word. And Lord, I know that we're not, you know, we're not the only church um, going through this. Pretty much every church uh, in the nation right now is, is dealing with this and uh, many that are meeting online uh, and through other, through other means. So Lord, but we know you're still here. Lord, you don't, uh, you're not confined to a building you're not confined to a, a certain geographic area, but you're with us at all times. So we pray this morning, Lord, that you would just open our hearts to what you want for us, open our ears to hear you, our eyes to see, our hearts to receive. And God, I pray you're anointed upon my words, that I would speak only what you've prepared my heart to speak, nothing more, nothing less. And Lord, in this, in this tough time that we're dealing with, help us to turn to you, to look to you for our hope and our refuge, and be with those, God, who, uh, who this is a tough time for them, whether it's... Uh, Older people, Lord, that are shut in and can't get out, Lord, I pray that people would surround them and, and, and help them where, where it's needed. For those who, Lord, are in fear and panic, I pray you bring calm and peace to them, Lord. And for the rest of us, I just pray you help us keep, stay focused on you, to not get, to not overreact to these things, but also to be mindful and cautious and not underreact either. Uh, Lord, we thank you for all you are and all you do, and we know you're with us, and we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, for those of you that might be new with us today, I just want to just briefly kind of catch you up on, on where we've been. Uh, our church uh, has been going through the book of Jeremiah for 2020. And back in November, I really felt like that's what God wanted for us, was to go through this, this one book basically for the entire year. Jeremiah has 52 chapters, and there's 52 weeks in a year. Now, we deviate here and there from Jeremiah, and, and we'll have guest speakers, and at least I hope so, if we can get back to meeting uh, during this time as well. But I, I felt, you know, I felt a few months ago that this was God's direction, and it seems very fitting now. Uh, if you don't know what Jeremiah is, I'll give you just a brief, a brief overview. So Jeremiah is a prophet to the nation of Israel um, back in the, you know, about the 6th, 6th and early 7th century BC. Uh, you know, Israel, for hundreds of years at this point, had uh, been walking away from the Lord. Uh, they've been welcoming foreign gods into not only into their lives and into their city, but even into the temple that was supposed to be dedicated to their God. Now they were putting pagan idols, they were worshiping other gods, they were trusting other gods, they were entering into these alliances with foreign nations when God told them not to, to just trust him. And all this was about to come home to roost, as they say. Um, Jeremiah was not the first prophet, but there were a, a string of prophets that, that were sent to Israel um, to, to warn them, to let them know that this wasn't okay and that because of their unfaithfulness, they were about to be attacked. And the people didn't listen. They ignored Jeremiah. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet because for 40 years of ministry, pretty much no one listened to him. I mean, imagine going 40 years um, as, a, as a minister and no one responds to your messages. You would probably feel like a failure. But Jeremiah wasn't a failure. He did what God had called him to do and led him to do. And unfortunately, the people uh, ignored, the people didn't listen, and eventually, as a last resort, 
God allowed them to be attacked uh, from, from the north by Babylon. And that the city was not just attacked, but it was destroyed. Right? Babylon uh, was known for being barbaric. They, they were scorched earth uh, conquerors. So they came in, they destroyed the land, they destroyed the temple, they killed many of the citizens, especially those who were well off. Um, and the ones they spared were largely the uh, lower class because they felt like they could, um, they could control them. And they brought them to their countries and, and had them serve them. So there, there's, a, there's a lot there going on that we really don't have time to get into uh, this morning. But that's a little bit of the background. So we're in Jeremiah chapter 12 today. And up to this point, you know, there's not a lot of courage in things in Jeremiah. I mean, it's, it's a very heavy book. It's, there's a lot there. But, and I'm not saying that Jeremiah's situation is our situation, but there are some similarities. And it really comes in the roots of that, right? The roots of the issues Israel had was in their disobedience and in their unfaithfulness. They started to turn, to put their trust in other things beside God. And before Judah was destroyed, uh, Israel had become a divided nation. There was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Uh, the, the northern kingdom had already been attacked and destroyed, and now this part of Israel, Judah, was the southern kingdom that eventually was destroyed by Babylon. So we're in a very similar time in our culture. We're a very divided culture, and not even just our culture at large, but the church. The church is very divided. Uh, churches are, are at each other's throats, and, and, there's, you know, and so much of it comes from the political landscape. You know, we know that there's division, and we're seeing that especially in a crisis where people can't turn that off. And it's still, you know, one side blaming the other, or the other side blaming the other, and no one seemingly taking any responsibility, and it's always someone else's fault. Um, it, you know, we see people, because of that, because of that division, some are overreacting to the situation we're in, others are underreacting. Uh, that's where Israel was, right? Israel, for the most part, was very apathetic toward the words that were spoken to them by Jeremiah and other prophets. They had false prophets in their country that were telling them uh, other things, saying, no, everything's going to be all right, you know, there's nothing to worry about. So, of course, they wanted to listen to them because it made them feel better. But the reality was that wasn't the truth, right? Jeremiah was the one preaching, prophesying the truth. And unfortunately, the people didn't listen, and their, their livelihoods were destroyed, and they were left to pick up the pieces. So Jeremiah 12 is where we are today, and here we have... Um, what's called one of Jeremiah's confessions. Um, you can imagine the, just the heaviness of what Jeremiah was called to do. Uh, it, it weighed on his heart. And at some point, even, even when you're doing the right thing, you can get frustrated. And Jeremiah got frustrated. So in this, in this scripture we're looking at today, he, he brings those frustration up to the Lord. And uh, so well, let's actually back up to chapter 11 and verse 18, because this is the context for, for Jeremiah 12. We're going to read through uh, just ch chapter 12, verse 4 for now. It says this, eleven eighteen, Because the Lord revealed their plot to me, said Jeremiah, I knew it. For at that time he showed me what they were doing. I had been like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. I did not realize that they had plotted against me, saying, Let us destroy the tree and its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name be remembered no more. But Lord Almighty, you who judge righteously and test the heart and mind, let me see your vengeance upon them. For you, I have committed my cause. This is what the Lord says about the men of Anatoth, and that was Jeremiah's hometown, who are seeking your life and saying, Do not prophesy in the name of the Lord, or you will die by our hands. Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty says, I will punish them. Their young men will die by the sword, their sons and daughters by famine. Not even a remnant will be left to them because I will bring disaster on the men of Anatoth in the year of their punishment. And then Jeremiah goes on to offer a complaint here in chapter 12. You are always righteous, O Lord, when I bring a case before you. Yet I would speak with you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the faithless live at ease? You have planted them and they have taken root. They grow and bear fruit. You are always on their lips but far from their hearts. Yet you know me, Lord. You see me and test my thoughts about you. Drag them off like sheep to be butchered. Set them apart for the day of slaughter. How long will the land lie parched and the grass and every field be withered? Because those who live in it are wicked. The animals and birds have perished. Moreover, the people are saying, he will not see what happens to us. God, I just pray in these moments you would, uh, you would open our ears to your word. Help us to engage with your word, God, to, to hear what you want us to hear, to Receive what you want us to receive. 
Lord, and to act accordingly. Uh, anoint my lips that I would speak, Lord, the right things that, that you desire, nothing more, nothing less. In Jesus' name, amen. So, you know, we see this uh, going on when in, with Jeremiah. We see this frustration. And he has a very legitimate, uh, legitimate gripe. His family members, his loved ones, his kin are plotting against him. They're not just plotting to, uh, so he has a bad day. They're plotting to kill him, the, the people of town. And so he can sense the frustration. He's, you know, he said, God, I'm like a lamb being led to the slaughter. And, and God, prom- God tells him in, in the latter part of chapter 11, he said, I will punish them. I'll take care of them. But yet even, even though he gives them that promise, Jeremiah is still, like, he's still frustrated. So in the opening of, verse, of chapter 12, he lays bare these frustrations, his doubts, his deepest feelings. And he said, God, you're always righteous. Right? You, you do all the right things. I understand that. But I would speak with you about your justice. This is a nice way of saying, uh, look, I got, I got a problem with you right now. I got an issue with you. But he's still trying to be respectful. Right? Have you ever done that where you butter somebody up, but you really want to confront them? That's what Jeremiah is doing, except he's confronting God. And, and then he, then he kind of, then you see his frustration, you see his emotions come out, and he says, why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the faithless live at ease? You planted them, and they have taken root. They grow, and they bear fruit. Now, if you remember Psalm chapter 1, right, Psalms, uh, Psalm chapter, or Psalm 1, it speaks of the, the righteous, right, will, will be like a, uh, a tree planted by, the street, by a stream of water. They, they'll bear fruit, and yet Jeremiah, and look, it's the wicked who are prospering. You know, Lord, you promised that the wicked wouldn't prosper, and yet they are, and I'm the one suffering. I'm the one doing your will, and yet I'm suffering. So you can understand his frustration. Right? He's asking questions that, that we all ask. Like, why do I suffer when other people that aren't following you seem to be prospering? Um, you know, questions like, you know, why, why do bad things happen to good people? Right? Why do good people, or why do bad people prosper and, and not come to justice these are all things that, that people throughout history have, have asked uh, ever since the Genesis 3 when, when sin entered the world. Uh, so instead of the wicked, like I t- Jeremiah who is suffering, and Jeremiah is struggling with this. You know, he, he goes on in verse 3, he said, You know me, Lord. You, know my, you, you see me and you test my thoughts about you. Right? This, has, th- this reminds me of Psalm 139 when King David, he said, Search me, O Lord. And know me, test my, my anxious thoughts, see if there's any unclean way in me. Right? And that's basically what Jeremiah said. He said, Lord, you know me, you know my heart, you know everything about me. So why is, you know, you already know I'm frustrated, and, and I want to know why this is happening. And in, in the, the, the second part of verse 3, he says, drag them off like sheep to be butchered, set them apart for the day of slaughter. Remember in chapter 11, Jeremiah's the one saying, I feel like a lamb being led to the slaughter. Now he's saying, God, take them. Let them be the ones that are slaughtered. Not really the, the, the mindset and the attitude of, of a believer in God. Right? I mean, especially uh, those of us who are Christians, to follow the ways of Jesus. And Jesus was very, like, outside of one or two times, was not one that, you know, he certainly didn't promote violence at all. And yet we see here Jeremiah saying, God, kill them. Take out my people. They want to kill me, kill them first. And you think about God as he, he, he listens, he lets, he lets Jeremiah vent. Uh, and maybe you've done that. I've done that. I've vented before God before. I've said things that afterwards I was embarrassed that I said them. But God listened. He let me speak. He let me speak my mind and my frustrations. And he, he did not hold it against me. So that's what he does for Jeremiah. He lets him speak. Right? And Jeremiah says, God, you know me. Right? You know my thoughts. You know everything about me. You know what I'm going through. You know that it's not right that, that they are prospering and I'm not. Uh, you know, his lament doesn't end with, with hope. It ends with, man, I'm frustrated and I don't know what to do, God, and I wish you would take him out. So then in verse 5, we see God's answer. Verse 5 and 6, it says, If you have raced with men on foot and they have worn you out, how then can you compete with horses? If you stumble in the safe country, how will you manage in the thickets by the Jordan, for your brothers, your own family, even they have betrayed you. Do not raise a loud, they have raised a cry against you. Do not trust them, though they speak well of you. So now God is saying, yeah, I hear you, but if you can't handle 
your family being against you, you haven't, you ain't seen nothing yet. Is essentially what he's saying. It's not God bragging, right? God's not. God doesn't take any joy in the fact that Israel has to be invaded for them to change their mind, right? To change what needs to be changed. But he's telling Jeremiah, he said, I know it's hard, but if you think this is hard, it's only going to get harder. Because once Babylon comes in and once this invasion starts, uh, it's going to be, you know, almost unlike anything that the nation had ever seen. So he uses two metaphors. The first is of a race. And he said, if you can't keep up with men, how can you keep up with horses? And it made me think of the church, right? You were in this time, and I, I would hope that all of us who are part of the church would say our mission is to shine the light of Christ, is to share the gospel. But how can we do that effectively if the churches can't even come together? If we're not united as a church, sometimes it's within a single church where there's division. If we can't stay united, if we can't, um, if we can't come together, how can we ever expect share the gospel with the world, to, to be effective in that. Because they're watching, they're looking at us, and I think a lot of times they look and they, they see the hypocrisy, they see the, they see the infighting, they see the division and say, why would we, what do you have to offer that's any better than what we've got here? And in some ways they're right. And, and certainly, it doesn't mean every Christian is like that and every church is like that, but it's, if even one is like that, it's too much. So we have to be very mindful of that. Um, if we can't stay united with one another, when crises like this happen, how can we ever hope to, to be impactful? And that's why I think that 2020 is such a big year for the church. Uh, and when I first started, I, I assumed that it had to do mostly with the election, right? It's an election year, that, so we knew it was going to get you know, really testy politically. But now we add the, you know, this coronavirus crisis. And in, in all of this, the church has two choices. Well, I guess they have three. One, they can... Um, they can just continue gung ho uh, and not really caring about their witness, right? And uh, and ruining the witness by fighting for political power. Two, we can be apathetic and do nothing and just sit back and, and say, well, I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to get into this. I'm just going to isolate myself, kind of do my thing. But the choice God wants us to make is that we we stand in the midst of the crisis, that we stand strong in the midst of that, that we don't fear, that we don't panic. But we continue to, to reflect the love of Christ. We continue to reach out to others, to show that love, to show that we care for our fellow man, uh, to honor God in all that we say and do. That's where we're supposed to be. Right? In the second metaphor, God uses the, the picture of, of a safe zone. He said, if you, if you stumble in the safety of your country, how will you handle the, the jungle, the thickets of Jordan? Uh, because you know, there was relative peace at the moment in Judah, even though they were doing all these wrong things, there wasn't a big crisis yet, even though God said, look, it's coming. But because there was peace, because there was safety there, he said, if you can't even handle that, it's, it's only going to get worse. And the church is supposed to be the safe place for us to be able to be honest and be able to, to really pour our hearts out and then listen to God. But if the church becomes a place of division, and then there's no way that we're going to survive or we're going to thrive in the world and in the chaos that, that the world brings. You know, it's in that safe place, the supposedly safe place, that Jeremiah found his own family betraying him, plotting his death. And I wonder if, if the church is there today. I wonder if we're plotting against one another, uh, betraying one another, rather than uniting for the cause of the gospel. And it feels like that sometimes. It feels like where we get battered the most is in the church because there's such division, and people, um, you know, flip out if you don't, like, we think we have to agree on 100% of things, and if we don't, then that person's not a Christian. I don't know how many times I've heard people say, well, you can't be this, you can't believe this, you can't think this and be a Christian. Well, who gets to determine that? That Like, that's not ours to determine, that's God's. It's God's kingdom, so God gets to determine who, you know, who's in, who's out, if you want to look at it that way. Um, so part of the problem is we've is when the church begins to seek power from the state, right, from government, from the world, that's when things start to fall apart. Because we we slowly turn away from God and trusting God wholeheartedly and and only God to change the hearts of people. To now we start lobbying for political power. We 
for worldly power so that we can influence and we can set laws, we can set rules and guidelines. We don't want that done to us, yet we often try to do the same thing to other people. So we've got, you know, we've got to understand this and recognize this. Uh, the church should be the place where we're, I mean, we're growing together, we're challenging one another. You know, this is where, where God speaks to us, and then we can go out into the world and be ready and be prepared. But if there's division and there's strife in the church, we're never going to be able to uh, make the impact in the world that God has called us to. So we can't even, our trust can't be in the institution of the church, in leaders, or in the institution of the worldly kingdom, right? There, with, with social media, with, with all the access to, um, to information, and churches now more than ever ha- have, have, a, have an influence like you've never had, right? Through, through the internet, through social media, there, pastors have made a name for themselves, uh, churches have made a name for themselves, but you have to grow through that. And I am not against that at all. There are some great, great churches out there doing great things that are well-known. There are some great pastors and teachers that are out there doing great things that are well-known. Well known. But there are also people that gain a following and an influence that aren't, doing, that aren't doing the right things. They're doing them in the name of Christ, but they don't really reflect Christ. So we've got to be careful, right? Our trust can't be in our favorite TV preacher. It can't be in, in our favorite church. It can't be in, in our, our favorite politician uh, can't be in, in the president no matter who it is. Our trust has to be in God and God alone because God's the only one that will never fail. And, and, and I know that that's tough because in the midst of, of all this chaos, you know, we look for something. We want to hold to something and God says, hold to me. You know, God can see what we can't see. God knows what's around the corner. God was not surprised by this coronavirus uh, outbreak. He was not surprised by the, the panic it would cause. He was not surprised by any of that. And he says, if you look to me, I'll, I'll show you what to do. I'll keep you safe. I'll give you peace and calm in the midst of the storm. So then God goes on, right? Jeremiah laments, and he's complaining about these things. But then God, after giving a, a brief answer to Jeremiah, God offers his own lament, in verse, starting in verse 7. And this is what he said. He said, I've had to forsake my house, abandon my inheritance, and give the one I love into the hands of her enemies. My inheritance has become to me like a lion in the desert. She roars at me, therefore I hate her. Just imagine those words. Has not my inheritance become to me like a speckled bird of prey that other birds of prey surround and attack? Go and gather all the wild beasts. Bring them to devour. Many shepherds will ruin my vineyard and trample down my field. They will turn my pleasant field into a desolate wasteland. It will be made a wasteland, parched and desolate before me. The whole land will be laid waste because there is no one who cares. Over all the barren heights in the desert, destroyers will swarm. For the sword of the Lord will devour from one end of the land to the other. No one will be safe. They will sow wheat but reap thorns. They will wear themselves out but gain nothing. So bear the shame of your harvest because of the Lord's fierce anger. So now we see God himself lamenting. And he's lamenting. He's complaining about, um, complaining is not the right word, but he's, you know, we see him declaring his, his deep feelings about Israel. Now, he loves Israel. He calls her uh, his house, his inheritance, the one he loves, right? This is, this is God's child. This is God's, you know, there's where the people of God are called uh, sons and daughters. They're called the bride of Christ. That's a very close, intimate relationship. God's saying, this is my house, my inheritance, my people, and yet I've, I've had to allow this to happen to them. They've turned on me. And this is the only way to, to get them to reset. Um, and it was not, I, I'm confident in saying it was the absolute last resort for God. He spent hundreds of years trying to warn them. And when it got down to it, he knew. Because he knew their hearts, he knew their minds, like Jeremiah said. He knew that there was nothing that was going to bring them to this re- realization except for allowing Babylon to come in and do what they did. So God is lamenting. You know, we see pain in his words. He took no joy or satisfaction in, in what was happening to the people. And he uses three metaphors. The first is of a lion. He says, she's become like a lion roaring at me. I don't know if you've ever faced a lion. I haven't. I've only seen them in, in zoos. But I can only imagine being out in the wild and, and facing a lion that realizes 
you know, you're on her territory or his territory and, and they don't like that and they turn and you let out a big roar. That's what God's saying. He said Israel is basically turned against him like a lion ready to attack him. He said, therefore, I hate her. And, and we may look at that and say, oh, God hates. Um, well, it's just that idea of, you know, a, of one who was once dearly loved turning against you and, and wanting, you know, wanting you out of their lives or wanting to harm you. So, so the people had become like that. They become, it says, a speckled bird of prey that had attracted other people, that had attracted these other nations um, that now surrounded and attacked her. See, the very nations and the idols to which Israel turned to when they were turning away from God for their protection, for all these things, were now the very ones turning against them. Their idols weren't any help. The pagan gods weren't any help to Israel. And so that's one of the points that God was making is that the very things you put your trust in outside of me are now the things that are going to destroy you. You know, Matthew 26, verse 52, uh, we have the account of Jesus. He's, he's, he's been arrested. One of the, uh, one of the Roman, Roman uh, soldiers lops, or Peter, I'm sorry, Peter lops off the ear of a Roman soldier trying to protect Jesus, right? He's trying to show Jesus, hey, I'm here for you. And Jesus rebukes Peter. He picks up the guy's ear, puts it back on, tells Peter, what are you doing? He said, if you live, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. In other words, the very things you trust in outside of me will likely be the very things that are your downfall. You know, Proverbs speaks of how pride comes before the fall, right? Pride and arrogance come before um, the destruction. The very things that Israel had turned to were now the very things that were destroying them. They had become prideful and arrogant, and that, that pride led to their destruction. So the, the third metaphor God uses is shepherds. He says, there are many shepherds that will ruin my vineyard. And in this case, he's not talking about the, the Jewish shepherds, but he's talking about foreign leaders. Right? Shepherds, basically just a picture of leaders, those who lead people, who lead, who lead sheep. So there were many foreign leaders, those that Israel had turned to for alliances and then to build these relationships they weren't supposed to, were now the very ones that were going to ruin Israel, ruin the, the, the vineyard, right? It's another picture for, for, God's, uh, for God's land, for the people's land. And then it says that they, they'll turn Israel into a wasteland, a desolate wasteland, right? The, this scripture uses that term multiple times just in those couple verses, desolate wasteland. And it's hard to, to really get the accurate connotation in English, but the Hebrew word for, for waste or wasteland there's a sense of finality or completeness, right? A complete annihilation. This was, this was a death, right? Lamentations respond of Israel after this destruction. And it's, it's really the people grieving the loss of their city. Well, they didn't just need repaired. Israel needed to be built from the ground up, right? They were so just completely wiped out. Good. We think of Romans chapter 12, uh, when Paul speaks of, you know, essentially speaks of how we need to be, to start from the ground up as well. He says, don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds, right? When it comes to following the Lord, it's not just, well, let's do, a, do these things, but it's, it's supposed to start with the transforming of our mind. In John chapter 3, we find the term born again, and that's the only place in scripture we find born again. But when Jesus told Nicodemus he needed to be born again, that phrase, it literally means born from above or born from the beginning, right? Born all over again. It's basically Jesus saying, if you want to follow me, so, you need to, so you've been born naturally, but you need to be reborn in basically blank slate, right? Let go of everything you've ever known and follow me and let me rebuild your, your mindset. Let me teach you my ways, how I see things, how I think. Right? And, and God says in the Old Testament, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. It means way above ours. We can't comprehend them. And that's a very hard thing to do, to lay everything down we've ever known, especially if you, you know, I came to the Lord in my teenage years, about 18, 19 years old, around there. Um, and so, you know, I was still kind of growing and developing my values. For people that come to the Lord later in life, They've had all these years of a certain way of thinking it, and it can be really, really difficult to let go of those, but that's what God calls us to do. He says, you need to lay down everything you thought before, 
the good, the bad, everything in between, and let me start you over. And that's a hard thing to do, but that's what we were called to do. And this is what this was for Israel. This was a reset. After this situation, they had to start over because they had nowhere else to turn. And they did well for a while, then it all happened again. And the temple was again destroyed in, in AD 70, late 60s, 70, where the Romans came in and destroyed the temple. And, and the same thing happened where the people became apathetic. They, they started turning away from their trust in God. So this is a constant thing. You would think that you know, it happened, they wouldn't do it again, but you get far enough down the road, it's bound to happen again. We have an opportunity in our day and age and what's going on now. We have an opportunity when all this, when the dust begins to settle, to really rise up and to, and to change the things that need to be changed and to begin a really a, a great awakening, right? A, 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 just a spiritual renewal that, that's, that's going to uh, impact people in so many positive ways. But it, de- it depends on us and how we respond in these times. So just be careful during this time that how, how we respond. Let's take the mindset of God. And if we don't know what that is, then we need to start from the ground up and let God build that up. So the final two verses, verses 12 and 13, uh, God speaks of the judgment that's to come. He said they're going to, uh, I want to focus especially on, on verse 13. He said they will sow wheat but, but reap thorns. They will wear themselves out but gain nothing. Now in, in the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus teaches what's called the parable of the sower. And in this teaching, if you're not familiar with it, and many of you probably are, but if you're not, um, Jesus basically gives an example of a farmer who sows seed on four different types of soil. The first, he puts it right on the path, right? There's no, it doesn't take root at all. The birds come down and snatch it. Uh, the second is a rocky place. And in the rocky place, it, it, there's no rich soil for there to be depth. So it, it, quit, it, it grows and quickly fades. The third is, is thorns, where it says it begins to grow, but the thorns choke it out. It's, and he equates it to the ways of the world choking out the word in people's lives. And finally, there's the good soil. You plant it in good soil, it grows, it, it, it multiplies, it produces uh, a great crop. So here, God is comparing Israel to the thorny soil. He said they, they sow wheat, but they're going to reap thorns because they had allowed the world to come into their temple. They'd allowed the pagan nations to influence them, and now it was choking out that special relationship that God had established with them. And then that second part, I think, is, what, is really what we need to hear. So they work, uh, they will wear themselves out. They'll work to the bone, but gain nothing. We are a nation here in, in America of <clears throat> work hard, right? If you work hard, then you will get what you deserve. You'll get your dreams. You'll get all that you want if you put the work in. And I'm not speaking, there, there's nothing bad about working hard. That's a good principle, but the fact is, if you're working hard at the wrong things, then you're going to gain nothing. I remember, I don't remember who the coach was, but I, I remember hearing an interview once with a coach, and the interviewer brought up the phrase, practice makes perfect. I think it was a basketball coach talking about free throws, and, and the coach just interjected and said, I hate that phrase. He said, practice does not make perfect because if you're practicing the wrong way, then all, then all you're going to do is perfect being bad or perfect the wrong thing. He said, perfect practice is what makes perfect. And his point was, if you, you can work hard, but if you're working hard at the wrong thing, if you're working hard to hone a skill, but you're doing it the wrong way, and then all you're doing is creating bad habits, you're making it worse for yourself. It's better to not work hard than to work hard at the wrong thing. Now, the best thing is to work hard at the right things. But I think a lot of times we, we work hard, we're all about, man, we're resilient, we're this, we're that. And we, we fail to sometimes just sit back and listen and, and take a breath because we're always pushing forward. It's always about doing more, gaining more, achieving more. That's the lifestyle we've built here in our, in our culture. And, but there comes a time where you might wake up and say, man, I've been working, 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 and I'm gaining nothing. And if you're there, that might be a sign that Maybe you're working hard in the wrong ways, in the wrong things. That's what God was saying about Israel. So they, they wear themselves out, but they gain nothing because they're working hard at the wrong things. They're apathetic in the things they should be working hard in, 
and they're working hard in the things that they, they should be letting go of. That's, that's what happens often. That we get apathetic in the important things and we get busy in the unimportant or sometimes the, the bad things. So this is where Israel found itself. Uh, God didn't take any joy, any satisfaction in their destruction, but that's what had to happen to, to get them a reset. I think God's given us a chance here uh, in our country, really in our world, is this a worldwide thing, to reset, to reset, to take some time and say, okay, God, what's, what am I missing here? What, what, what do I need to hear from you? And I encourage you to do that, to, to listen. So finally, we, we close chapter 12, and it says this in verse 14. This is what the Lord says. As for all my wicked neighbors who seize the inheritance I gave my people Israel, I will uproot them from their lands, and I will also uproot the house of Judah from among them. But after I uproot them, now pay attention to this, we're going to focus on this. After I uproot them, I will again have compassion and bring each of them back to his own inheritance and his own country. And if they learn well the ways of my people and swear by my name, saying, As surely as the Lord lives, even as they once taught my people to swear by Baal, then they will be established among my people. But if any nation does not listen, I will completely uproot and destroy it, declares the Lord. So now God's speaking of those enemies that Jeremiah was talking about, in a way. Right? Jeremiah's initial question was, God, why aren't you doing something? Take them out. So God is saying here, look, Jeremiah, everyone that's come against my people, I'm going to take care of. So they will be uprooted, and Judah is going to be uprooted from among them. I'll, I'll protect my people. I'll get them out of there, get them back to their land. But I'm also going to uproot the, the pagan nations. But then he says this. Okay, it's one thing to say, yep, yeah, I'm going to take care of them. But then he says this. He says, but after I uproot them, I will again show them compassion and bring each of them back to their country, to their inheritance. So God is saying the very people that destroyed my nation, destroyed my people, that destroyed Israel, I'm going to give them compassion. And if you're, if you're Jeremiah, if you're one that was part of Israel when it got destroyed, you wouldn't be very happy with God right now. You'd be saying, why would you show compassion on them? They're not deserving of it. right? God essentially said, I'm going to give them two options. That first option is, if they, if they turn to me, if they learn my ways, and they honor my name, then I'll establish them among my people. right? Not, not only will he take care of them, he says, I'm going to establish them as my people. So if you're Israel, that could be very disconcerting too because you're like, why? Not only are you going to show compassion, but you're going to, you're going to give them the relationship we have with you? And God said, yeah, because that's who he is. He's a compassionate God. He's a loving God. He's a merciful God. The problem is a lot of us who are followers of Christ, we might not agree with God's compassion and his mercy. We look at people that are absolutely doing evil things and we might say, why are they deserving of mercy? Like they deserve punishment. They deserve to be judged. And that, and that may be true. But who are we that we deserve God's love or mercy or grace any more than anyone else? And that's the point God's making. He said, this is who I am. I'm a compassionate God. He always has been. That's his nature. So even for those that are the most evil, God still gives them a chance. He still shows them compassion, gives them an opportunity to recognize what's going on, what's missing in their lives, and to turn to him. See, God answered Jeremiah's question, but probably not the way he wanted. He basically said, I'll deliver you, and I'll deal with those who are coming against you, but after I deal with them, I'm going to show them compassion and mercy. I'm going to give them the opportunity to know me, to be my people, if they accept, I'll establish them among my people. If not, then I'll deal with that accordingly. So they have those options, right? The people can deny it. They can reject it. But God says, I'm still going to give them that chance. And he calls us to have that same attitude, that no matter how people have hurt us, because God's compassionate, we have to allow for that compassion and that grace and that forgiveness for other people. And that's tough. Believe, believe me, I get it. I've been there. Uh, some of you might be there right now. And that's okay as long as you admit that, acknowledge that, and acknowledge that, Lord, this isn't the right attitude. 
right? Jeremiah acknowledged his, acknowledged his attitude. He confessed what was going on in his heart, and God confronted that. Jonah, right, Jonah was similar. Jonah confessed. Jonah was called to go to Nineveh to preach the gospel. Jonah didn't want to. He ran away. He gets swallowed by a great fish, spits up, finally goes to Nineveh, um, not because he wanted to, but basically just out of obligation. And then even after everything happened, right, the people repented. They were, uh, God relented from his punishment. And these were very barbaric people at the time as well. And Jonah was mad. He said, God, I knew this was who you are. I knew you were compassionate. I knew that you would show them mercy. And he didn't want that. He wanted them to be destroyed. And if we're, if we're honest, we'll admit that we have some of those same thoughts. Right? We don't want people to prosper. We don't want certain people. We, we want to see them fail. We want to see them struggle because we feel like they deserve that. But that's not a Christ-like heart or attitude. And, and really, all it does, it speaks more of us than it does of anyone else. If I take pleasure in someone else's demise, that doesn't say a lot for me as a human being. What I, what I pray and what I, I hope that you guys pray for is I pray that my heart gets broken for people like that, that I don't, I don't just cast anyone aside but say, Lord, I don't know how they got to that point. I don't know why, but intervene in their lives. Lord, show them compassion, help them to see you. Because people don't wake up one day and just decide to be evil and do, do horrible things. But see, God's not exclusive. God's an inclusive God. We have to make room for all people because God makes room for all people. It's his house, his rules. Even those that might currently be your enemies, might currently be those who oppose us. See, God will be with us in the storm. God's going to be with us um, in this crisis right now. He'll deliver us from it. He'll reestablish us in the aftermath. And he'll deal with those that, that plot evil against you and against others. But he'll also show compassion and invite them to know him just as he invites us to know him. See, it's his house, it's his kingdom. You don't go to somebody else's house and tell them the rules. When you go to someone else's house, you abide by their rules. If they ask you to take your shoes off, you take your shoes off. If you don't, you're not going to be their guest. Well, this, God's kingdom is his. It's his house. He gets to make the rules. I don't get, who am I to determine who gets in and who gets out? What have I done? Like, I, I'm, I have no, there, I shouldn't have any authority on who's in and who's out. Yet, often I've heard people say, well, you can't believe this and still be a Christian. You can't think this and still be a Christian. Like, who, we, we don't have that right. It's not our house. It's not our kingdom. It's not our rules. We aren't more deserving than anyone else. And the moment we think we are, we need to stop and we need to turn to God because that's, that's the beginning of a bad, a bad road. The moment we think we deserve grace, we deserve love, we deserve blessing and prosperity, we need to take a step back, check our hearts, and, and, and get back to where we're supposed to be. As I said earlier, the institution of the church is not the answer. The institution of the state of the nation is not the answer. Jesus is. And there's a difference between Jesus being the answer and the church being the answer. Yes, God has called us collectively as the church to reflect Jesus in our society. But it's not the institution. Like It's not the building. This is what's cool about, I think, this time is churches are going to be finding more and better ways to connect with people. It's not just coming to a building and meeting for an hour, hour and a half on, on a Sunday, but it's, it's, it's engaging not only with other believers, but engaging your culture. It's taking that out into the marketplace, as we call it, taking it outside the church to where people are, where people are that are lost and broken and hurting and need to know Jesus. See, God's ultimate purpose for all people is that they might experience his compassion and his love, and restore them to their rightful identity as sons and daughters of God. The only thing we're, we're to do is to trust him and his ways as modeled to us through, through Jesus. Because in Christ, enemies become family, the broken become restored, the sick become well, those in fear are given faith, the chaos finds peace, hatred becomes love, the lost become found. Like, that's the power of Christ. He can turn 
the hearts of the most evil men and women. The Apostle Paul went around arresting Christians and, and giving approval to their death. And yet one encounter with Jesus and he did a 180. His life was completely different. He now became the one that was persecuted. He endured imprisonment. He endured beatings, being left for dead. Yet he did it all saying, I do this gladly for the sake of Christ because I know who he is. And I know the bigger picture. See, there's a bigger picture than just our, des our desires, our wants, our rights. A much bigger picture. And I hope that this time we're going through now with this coronavirus outbreak will, will help us to see the bigger picture, right? To understand that there is a bigger picture. Even if I don't know what it is, it's there. What we see is just a, a small piece of the puzzle, of a giant puzzle that God can see, right? The Bible says that God holds the universe in the palm of his hand. So we're a speck on a speck on a speck. God is so much bigger than our situations. He's so much bigger than, than our lives, than any problems we may face. So I, I appreciate everyone joining in today and, and, and hopefully engaging with, with this word. Um, you know, I, I just want, I want to close in prayer. And I wrote down this prayer because I, I don't often do this, but I just felt specifically led to pray a particular way. So I'd encourage you, wherever you are, to pray along with me, close your eyes, or just give attention to this. But Lord, bless our enemies. And show them your love and compassion. Lord, restore those that are broken among us. Heal those that are sick among us. Cause faith to rise amidst our fear and bring peace to the restless. Lord, heal our hearts of hate, anger, bitterness, and the like. May, may we be people instead that honor you, that honor our fellow brothers and sisters, that honor our world and reflect Jesus in all that we say and do. Thank you for your boundless love, your endless compassion, your mercies, which are new every morning, your grace that forgives and restores, and your spirit that empowers us to live a life of love. Be with us in these times and help us to see you in the midst of the storm. Have peace in the midst of the chaos and come together rather than further divide. Lord, renew our minds. Thank you for all you are and all you do. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us if you did this morning. And, and just kind of in closing, um, you know, check out, our, check out our, our, our website. Check out our Facebook page. If, if you are a regular member and you want to keep giving, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a link that will be posted um, where you can give uh, electronically if you want to give that way. Or you can, you can mail it in if you want. Um, I trust God because I know some of you are, aren't working right now because of this or you're working less or you might not be working, you're not sure. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not begging anyone for money. If you want to give and you, you choose to give, man, we're really thankful for that. But I trust God to, to see us through this. Um, so, so please don't take that as any kind of plea. It's just simply for your information. For those of you that, that are shut in or you, you might fall in that category of, it's, of this is, is more dangerous for you and you need help running errands, getting things like that, please contact us. Uh, my, myself, or I know there's others that would make ourselves available to help you with that. And anyone that wants a visit, please reach out to me. I'm, I'm, if you invite me into your home, I will gladly come in and pray for you, um, speak with you, just be with you, whatever it is you need during this time. Uh, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out and contact us. Uh, again, this is, a, this is a time for the church to, to stand up and be the church and, and do the things that we're supposed to do, right, for our, our fellow human beings, not just those who believe like us and look like us and think like us, um, but those who are the exact opposite. So yeah, thank you for joining in. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, if you haven't already started it, uh, Miss Margaret has her uh, kids' church lesson that's going to be up. Uh, parents, I encourage you to watch it along with your kids. Uh, whatever medium you're using, it'll be on Facebook. It's on our YouTube channel as well. Check out any of those. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna get better with this each week that we can't meet. We plan to, we're hoping to meet on Easter Sunday, that's April 12th. Uh, we'll see what's mandated by then. Uh, but right now, we will be doing church online until then. God bless you all, love you. Really appreciate you stopping in today.